Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Sketch Adventure. On today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at folds and drapery. I'm going to be doing a demo of each of the seven types of folds that I think about when painting fabric. The first type of fold that we'll be looking at is a pipe fold. The material hangs from one tension point and the fold always points back towards it. A consistent element in all types of folds is that the shapes of the folds always flow in a direction. They always have movement. The pipe fold is the least interesting because the shapes just aren't as dynamic as the others. They just point to one direction, like a bunch of cones. As usual, I establish my shadows first. A well-designed image, whether that's an illustration or just an object, should be clear to the viewer after just adding one value, as though you're using ink. I'll be using three values in all the gouache paintings, one value for the shadows and two for the lights. It's really important to be able to clarify anything with minimal values before adding in more and dealing with edges. The reason why I'm using two values for the lights is that by having small portions of the paper peek through, those can act as highlights, and we'll use these highlights to show the corners of each form. The next type of fold is called a diaper fold. This is because it now has two tension points. Because of this, it creates much more interesting shapes. The shapes flow between the two tension points and sag in the middle. If one tension point is higher or lower, the result will be faster sweeping shapes. The main takeaway in all this is to consider how the folds of fabric are created as a result of tension points, and the fabric usually flows towards them. Most of the time when looking at fabric, it'll contain a combination of fold types. On the left side of this one, we can see that there's some pipe folds as well. This is taking place on the other side of the left tension point, which means that the fabric is only hanging from the one point. I find that having knowledge of fold behaviors is especially useful when painting any type of drapery from imagination. It seems to come up most often for me when there's characters involved. Because we're simplifying these, the most important aspect of conveying the folds accurately is the shadow shapes. Actually, even if we were spending 10 hours on this, the shadow shapes would still be the most important part. I've probably mentioned the importance of the two value light dark foundation in every video. Notice just how much information the highlights communicate when placed somewhat accurately. By standing out on the even middle value, they're describing a simple corner on each form. It isn't much, but it's really effective. All the shapes here are conforming to the behavior of the diaper fold. In the central area where the fabric hangs, the shapes reflect that. They begin to bow and hang as well. On to the third fold, the zigzag fold. This one's created as a result of compression. When you roll up the sleeve of a sweater, you create zigzag folds, which spiral around the form. These aren't from twisting, however, which creates a separate fold, but compression alone. It's very common to see both the zigzag and spiral fold occur at the same time. You may notice that when I block this one in, it ends up being a little weaker. That's because, you guessed it, the shadow shapes aren't as clear or as prominent as the other examples. They really do act as the anchor of a piece and it should never be overlooked. If I'm working on an illustration, I'll spend most of my time after I figure out the composition on planning the light and dark pattern. If I can create a clear light and dark pattern, the rest of the piece is easy. Let's get specific as to why they aren't working as well in this example. For starters, it would have been better for the shadow shapes to encompass a larger portion of this painting. 
and in general I haven't simplified the three major groups well enough. It is quite difficult to simplify these types of folds that have many little forms while still indicating them, but that's part of the challenge. The fourth type of fold is the spiral fold. This one's caused from the twisting of a sleeve, or any material that wraps around a cylindrical form. The key with this one is to create spiraling shapes that suggest the twisting of the material. But first, you do need to understand the underlying perspective of the cylinder. Learning to draw and paint realistically is so much more than just being able to reproduce photographs. To create paintings of any kind that go beyond the limitations of photos require the painter to arrange the visual information. It's the equivalent of a writer using too many words to get his point across. Just because they're in the dictionary doesn't mean you should be using them. If you can use the fewest words possible to communicate an idea, then both the message and your intention will be crystal clear. Just as I did in the other examples, I paint the shadows first, trying to convey the twisting fabric from the shadow shapes alone. After those are established, I'll put down my middle value for the lights. Because my highlights are the white of the paper, I need to be thinking about those corners as I lay down my middle value. You may be wondering why I keep referring to the highlights as corners, even though we're working with cylindrical forms. That's because I find it helps to conceptualize all forms blockier than they actually are. This way I'll always be considering the perspective and structure of each shape I put down. And because we're working on a flat piece of paper, it's really important to make sure that each shape counts when it comes to showing the viewer information about the pictorial space. Number 5. The Half Lock This fold is created at a pinch point, like an elbow. Its defining quality is that it radiates out from the pinch point in a series of tiny folds. You'll also see in this example that there's some spiral folds and zigzag folds as well. I feel like it's a good time to remind you that despite all my analytical talk, when I paint I prefer to be intuitive. I did spend a long time being conceptual, and I do enjoy theory, but ultimately what matters is that a painting looks interesting and correct. So if you ever find yourself not drawing or painting because you're trying to memorize information, then I suggest you paint instead and just jot down a few notes here and there. I mention this because in the beginning I spent too much time memorizing information and theory. I thought it was making me a better artist somehow, but in reality it was doing more harm than good because I mistook knowledge for practice. The shadow shapes are much better in the half lock example. On the upper arm they show the general plane on the right that's in shadow and on the bottom of the lower arm they indicate a sliver of underplane as well in shadow. If we compare those few simple structural truths to the lack of that information in the previous example, the difference is quite pronounced. Interestingly, the fix for the spiral fold example would only take a few brush strokes. So much of clear painting comes from a few well-placed strokes rather than many clever details. Okay, so with this one I wanted to see how well I could communicate the feeling of motion in fabric when it's caught in the wind, or a similar type of movement. Again, the problem ends up being that I don't have my large shadow shapes established. I've got my medium and small, but without the large shapes there isn't an anchor. That being said, I do feel like I captured the feeling, but in a somewhat abstract way. It looks more like a solid object with small flowing grooves in it. And if we think about it, this is precisely what the large shadow shapes would remedy. The large shapes would help depict large areas of billowing material obscuring the light. I thought it would be good to show it nonetheless, as even with this it shows a path that all these shapes flow down. And lastly we have inert folds. This is simply a pile of fabric that isn't hinging on any tension point. It's very difficult to create from imagination because there are so many factors. 
I also have a hard time thinking of one you'd want to depict a pile of inert fabric in an illustration, but I would just shoot reference if I had to. That being said, just like the other folds, they should be clearly communicated with large shadow shapes being the anchor, followed by medium and small shapes to give context to the forms. I'm going to be starting a series on this channel that depicts my process for painting traditional illustrations from start to finish. I'll likely break it up into multiple episodes, and in between some I'll still make sure to have these types of videos as well. If you guys have any suggestions on what you'd like to see me cover, please let me know in the comments. Because my channel is still rather new, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I want to focus on, but right now I do feel like it's going to go towards the process of illustrating. Okay guys, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next sketch adventure.